Hi students, in this lesson we are going to look at subsistence strategies and I have a description, a definition of what a subsistence strategy is on the board behind me. This is a way that societies, groups of people, populations of people get the resources. How do they get the resources? How do they use what's available in their environment? How do they innovate and um, figure out ways to manipulate their environment? That kind of stuff in order to have enough food um, to survive survive and to support the numbers of people in a population. So I don't have very much written on the board back here, but we're going to cover a lot. I've got five specific topics here that um, we're going to talk about a lot in this video. And so your job is going to be to take notes on each of them, pause the video when you need to make me repeat stuff, you know, back it up and have me repeat stuff so that you can include it in your notes because you're going to have to be answering some questions about the details of these things, not just what they are, one through five. And the five things that I'm going to talk to you specifically about in this subsistence strategy video are the five subsistence strategies. Foraging, horticulture, pastoralism, agriculture in the early days before we had machines, and then also industrialism, which is industrialized agriculture or intensive agriculture that, um, you know, to use the phrase that you will see in the portion of these chapters uh, 10 and 11 that we're uh, focusing on this week. Okay, so a subsistence strategy is, in a nutshell, a food getting strategy. So you can um, include that with this information that I have on the board behind me. So a food getting strategy or a subsistence strategy is about the tactics that people in society use to get the food that is needed food and other resources. So for instance, if you need to, if you need shelter to survive, what kind of shelter do you need? Do you need a hard shelter to protect you from a cold environment or harsh weather? Do you need a temporary shelter like, um, like a hut or something that you can move because you're nomadic and you can set it up easily someplace else? What kind of shelter do you need? Where do we get the materials for those shelters? And also uh, clean water resources. We must have clean water to survive. So a survival survival strategy is what you can think of when you uh, hear the word subsistence strategy. It's a tactical plan to get those resources that a society needs to survive. And the tactical plan becomes customary. It becomes part of the culture in that society. And that's important to realize. Some of these words that we're going to talk about regarding subsistence strategies historically, what got us to where we are today as a human population spread out throughout the globe and then also um, what is happening now and what we plan for in the future as far as our subsistence strategies go this becomes ingrained in the culture in the patterns of thinking feeling and acting that people in the in the, not only the United States I started to say the United States but in the world expect for where um, their resources are going to come from, how to process those resources, get those resources, and um, move on from there. So subsistence strategies, big deal, because you can't have population expansion, growth at all. You can't have the different phases of the demographic transition model without enough food and enough resources to support the size populations that you see happen in those five different stages of the demographic transition model. So I've put um, a picture of the demographic transition model in uh, this weekly folder so that you can look at it and um, follow along. But let's talk about historically. Um, the uh, which would correspond to stage one of the demographic transition model where there's high birth rate and there's also a high death rate. Um, foraging is the um, main is the only subsistence strategy that got human beings to survive the first 40,000 years that um, human beings, um, Homo sapiens sapiens, were on the earth. Okay, so foraging, perhaps you are more familiar with the name hunting and gathering. So that's a, a piece of information that you need to um, include with your explanation of foraging. It includes hunting and gathering and trapping and, you know, using the natural resources that are available in the environment as the environment gives them to you. 
In other words, it's important to note that if you exist, existed, or if you practice a purely foraging uh, subsistence strategy, your culture becomes one that you do not take too much from the natural environment. You only take what you need. You don't waste anything in the natural environment because you are not manipulating the natural populations of plants and animal resources that you need to survive. You're not manipulating those uh, resources to have a higher birth rate so you have more of them or a higher um, you know, spread of plants. You are not saving seeds from one season to the next so that you can plant things intentionally the following season to have some kind of yield um, of that particular food uh, supply that maybe you rely on. So a forager has very, very advanced knowledge about the climate in which they live. They have a very, very advanced knowledge about reproduction patterns of the natural wildlife in the area. They have a very, very deep and personal knowledge with the environment about where plants grow and produce themselves and how to find them and what time of year to find them. Foragers have a very, very intimate, respectful relationship with the environmental with the environment around them. So foraging is the original subsistence strategy that allowed human beings to survive and it doesn't manipulate the environment at all. When we look at the five themes of geography, in particular uh, human environmental interaction, there's a ton of human environmental interaction, but what the humans do in foraging is they only harvest from the natural environment enough for them to get by and the population they need to support to get by. Um, and they also don't harvest all of it. They have an intimate knowledge that other animals other creatures in the natural environment might need some of the same resources for their own food supply. And since you rely on those animals as part of your food supply too, you're gonna leave some of that crop, some of that plant, you're gonna leave it there so that other animals have it and you're going to not take too much so that the other animals eat it all up and it can't reproduce itself the following season. So it's a cycle, it's a constant um, understanding and participation with the natural environment. And you don't have to talk about uh, sustainability because it's built into the way that, that foraging societies exist. You don't have to talk about conservation because it's built in. Con conserving populations of plants and animals so that they persist year after year is part of the culture. It becomes the customary way that that population interacts with the environment. And so foraging is um, the way in which human beings survived to, uh, to begin manipulating, you know, changing and, and begin manipulating the environment so their populations could go up. Now in foraging, usually in popula populations are intentionally kept low because the more people that you have, the more resources that you need and nature only produces so many resources without manipulation. And the thought doesn't occur to you to manipulate the environment um, because that's not your cultural way. It's not seen as something that you should do because it is um, against nature. And so that would become your customary way with foraging. And so that's why that stage one of demographic transition can, um, can really re uh, represent like 40,000 years worth of, of history. So historically foraging um, is that traditional subsistence strategy. There, I, I have here on the board behind me, a little bit of it exists today. Like you will find some cultures, some societies around the world, small scale, small populations that still practice foraging, but not very much. Um, we have, we industrialized people, people with a different subsistence strategy mindset um, don't see that particular lifestyle as valuable anymore. Can I just insert the word unfortunately here? Um, because foraging doesn't create any of the pollution issues or the climate issues or any of those things that industrialization 
which is where you and I come from, it doesn't produce any of those issues that right now we're trying to artificially correct. Okay, so um, a little you, you'll find it a little bit today. And then, um, so there in your textbook, I think it's in chapter 11, there's a heading that says subsistence agriculture. I have the anthropological word here on the board for that, horticulture. And so when you're reading about subsistence agriculture, um, that's what I'm talking about here, horticulture. It's important for you to note that in typical agriculture, when you hear the word agriculture, it's got an economic system associated with it too. With agriculture in general, you're looking at a surplus. Your intention is to produce a surplus so that you have more than what your family and your immediate social group needs. You have enough to sell or trade for a profit or for other goods and services that you might need to increase your um, standard of living, increase your life experience, for instance. Okay, so what we're talking about with horticulture, you are not producing a surplus. You are not producing more than your immediate family and your immediate social group needs. The population goes up in horticulture because you do have a more predictable amount of resources that you can rely on annually to support yourself and the population. Horticultural societies are very communal. And if you look at different phases of history, recent history, for instance, like during the Mexican Civil War, um, Emilio Zapata was a leader of um, the resistance, the resistance to the governmental changes that were happening. And he represented the horticultural kind of, um, of communal society that was traditional in Mexico and the, the modernization efforts in the government were trying to get rid of that because the, um, they, wanted, they wanted to move into intensive agriculture and, and move into um, you know, ownership and, and, and uh, surplus production. But a horticultural society works together as a community to manipulate the environment so that you have a predictable amount of a crop that or, or two or three or four, a, a predictable amount of food that you produce on an annual basis to support the whole community. Your population can go up because you are manipulating the environment to produce more food than it would naturally give you if you just left everything to mother nature. So you are using human ingenuity as your customary way to provide food for your environment. You're, you're using know-how, you are saving seeds, you are planting seeds, you are using the ground. You're, you're clearing the ground maybe that did have trees on it, it did have a grassland. You're clearing that in order to be able to use the soil, manipulate the soil to produce what you want it to produce, not just the random trees and the random um, grasses and plants that are going to be produced by mother nature you're going to clear that and produce that amount of food that you need now in horticulture um, and anybody who has um, you know a backyard tomato patch or peppers or whatever like like I grow at my house anybody who has that knows that you can't just put it into regular old soil a year after year the same regular old soil and expect the same amount of um, yield, expect the same amount of tomatoes and the same amount of, um, of peppers. And so in a horticultural society, there isn't miracle Grow garden mix that you can go to the big box store and pick up. You have to, in, through your ingenuity, you have to use the knowledge about your natural environment so that you can add to that soil and manipulate that soil in a way that you can rely on um, a, a sub. Uh, a specific yield from year to year and season to season. And so what you see often with horticulture societies is you see something called slash and burn 
horticulture. Um, slash and burn sounds violent and horrible, so we sometimes use the word swidden, S-W-I-D-D-N, swidden cultivation, and that essentially is, is a word that means slash and burn, and let me just correct um, the ominous sound, of, you know, the violent sound of slash and burn um, in your mind for just a second, in case you're thinking, gosh, that sounds terrible. Slash and burn um, horticulture is a very sustainable economic, uh, uh, environmentally, not economically, environmentally friendly uh, way of reintroducing nutrients into the soil using biochar. And so if you are a horticulture community, you don't pick up and move the village every single time you've used up the resources or the nutrients in the land. The village stays stationary. A forager can pick up and move, a you know, move their little camp to a new place to start harvesting the things in this new place that they need to um, to sustain themselves but in a horticultural village you are stationary and what you do is that the men of the village would go out to this particular field over here and that's where you're planting your food and you're tending your food and another group of men would go over to this other field over here and I'm moving my hands I know if you're listening to this um, you can't see uh, that I'm moving my hands but I, there's a field over here that's producing your food there's a field over here that has intention not produced food for maybe a decade or even two and it's just been left alone we call that lying fallow F A L L O W and lying fallow land means that nature takes over and adds you know birds drop seeds animals move in and live there trees grow there's all kinds of um, life that is reintroduced into that soil if 20 years ago that particular field was used for two or three years in a row to produce the food that the community needed then uh, for the next 20 years it's left alone so that mother nature can put those nutrients back into the soil in um, if in the uh, through the mechanism, there's the word I'm looking for, through the mechanism of natural plants and animals moving back into the landscape. And so what you would do, 20 years pass and you need to move your field from here to over here because you've used up the nutrients in this field. So you go and you slash the trees, you cut them off, you dig up the, the roots, you slash the grasses. You know, the, as you're doing this, little animals that have lived there, you know, move out and they've left their poop there and they've left their carcasses there and they've left all kinds of waste there and you set the field on fire slash and burn is, is what this means you set the field on, field on fire you have a controlled burn you have all this biochar which is a wonderfully rich fertilizer natural fertilizer that you can then work into the soil your soil bingo is is wonderful to use again and you can plant um, your crops on that particular plot of land for the next two, three, five years, however, however much it, um, that biochar enriches the soil. And so then once you use it all up, you move to the next one. And that's how life, that's the customary way that that population um, plans for and uh, gets food and the other resources that it needs to survive on a daily basis. And so every member of the society has kind of a high rank, uh, just like in foraging, everybody hunts, everybody gathers, everybody processes, everybody builds the tools and the baskets and the stuff that they need in order to have a successful hunting and trapping and gathering um, expedition. Well, in horticulture, the same happens. You end up with a difference between the um, agricultural kind of work and the domestic work. So you do have males and females with two different base jobs to do, but the females have a great deal of um, respect and position in this society because they process the food and um, train the children to make the tools that are necessary to do all of this by hand and to process the food themselves. And so you do end up with um, a difference in status 
fairness of males versus females, but you still have relative equality and relatively the same social value between the work that men do and the work that females do in society. The work that elderly do and the work that children do in society. So elderly people in these cultures also offer a whole lot of knowledge, a whole lot of know-how, a whole lot of skills that they can pass from their generation to the next generations that are alive within, you know, that they meet within their lifetime before they die. And so um, when you look at foraging and horticulture, these are not um, easy ways of life necessarily, but they are very fulfilling as far as not being taxing at all on the environment and also having relative equality and same social standing among those people who are in those populations. Okay, so this video is getting kind of long, so I think I'm going to leave the board the way that it is and um, end now, and then we'll come back and talk about pastoralism, and then the other two, we'll see um, if I can get all three of them in the same lecture um, in the next video. Okay, so bye for now.